It is Friday, January 14th, let's talk PlayStation. Hello everyone, welcome back. This is a very special occasion because it's episode 500 of Let's Talk PlayStation. If you didn't notice, I number every single upload, which means this is the 500th week in a row, or nearly in a row, that I've done this. Um, and we'll talk about that later, really, because we actually have a lot to go over from this past week. So, and that's a good thing, but we'll talk about, you know, episode 500 and do a quick little conversation towards the end after Let's Talk Plus. For now, though, let's start off, as always, with our PS Plus reminder. So, the January games, make sure you grab them. That's Persona 5 Strikers, Dirt 5, and Deep Rock Galactic. You know what to do. And for our first story, let's talk about PS4 manufacturing, because there was a recent Bloomberg report that suggested that Sony may be considering, uh, they were planning on, you know, ceasing manufacturing at the end of last year, but allegedly, due to PS5 shortages, they are continuing to make PS4 throughout the, uh, the rest of this year. And allegedly, they'll also make about a million more units to help, quote, alleviate some of the pressure on PS5. Now, a Sony spokesperson responded to Bloomberg and said they did not plan on ending PS4 production and that there is always crossover between generations as an explanation for why the story was not true. But uh, whether it is or is not true, I mean, this was something where we were curious about it during the 2022 uh, predictions video that we did here. Uh, we are not sure, or at the time we weren't sure, if PS4 was still actually being made. The base PS4 model. PS4 Pro, we know that's been discontinued, but when it came to base PS4, it's kind of up in the air, right? Because it's actually really hard to buy one right now alongside PS5, depending on where you look. So uh, PS Direct, uh, I think, still has some, but otherwise you go to Target, Amazon, Walmart, uh, at least those websites oftentimes do not have it at MSRP, so it's usually a third-party seller. You might have luck in person at retail, but uh, consumers are very willing to jump into PS5 if the you know the stock availability is there, which it's it's not. So, uh, assuming that they did okay during Q4 and maybe made a little bit more than I guess a million more consoles going into this year is not entirely unusual. I would honestly be surprised if they made a million and then also sold that million because at this point I don't think they're going to sell more than you know, a quarter of a million every single quarter for this current year, but either way, it's still typical for Sony where they will manufacture the outgoing system for at least a minimum of two to three years going into the next one. So it's not unusual, but I do think it's a bit strange how this Bloomberg report phrased it, like alleviating pressure off PS5 by making more PS4s. Like yeah, that's kind of a silly way to phrase it, right? Making a million more PS4s to alleviate the, you know, easily 15 to 20 million PS5s that they could easily sell in theory if they made enough of them. Eh, it was just a weird way to, to put it like that because clearly PS4 is not doing PS5 any favors whatsoever. But again, it's typical for Sony to keep making the old one and that's, uh, I guess that's what they're gonna keep doing, which uh, is fine. Moving on to our next news story, as reported by GameSpeed, it looks like PS Now prepaid gift cards are being removed from game stores in the UK, where an internal memo is being sent around to game employees about how by January 21st, those PS Now prepaid cards should be taken down. And Sony has actually, they've already issued a statement to GameSpeed in response saying they're favoring or streamlining, uh, they're streamlining this down to PlayStation Store standard gift cards, right? So using those funds to top up your wallet and then use that to buy PS Plus now or whatever else that you want to buy but they're not really acknowledging or rather they're going to flat out ignore the current rumor about you know Spartacus the rumored uh, PlayStation service where it's going to consolidate and possibly remove PS Now branding which that would be the thing to go we've you know talked about that already but um, that seems to be the case of what's happening here and actually this isn't really brand new information so when this story came out uh, a lot of people were bringing up that hey Actually, PS Now, you know, prepaid cards, they've been gone for a few months here in the U.S., um, which I didn't notice, but then again, how often are, you know, people going to stores to buy prepaid PS Now gift cards? Probably not many people, uh, but it seems like this has been in the works for a bit, and this would be what they're planning on doing. So they're not going to talk about it, but yeah, this is probably uh, what's happening here. So not exactly surprising. Uh, now, as a bonus to the story, there's been a new patent uh, filed by Sony Interactive Entertainment that has been circulating online the last one or two days regarding backwards compatibility with the inventor being Mark Cerny. And it started on Twitter, uh, made the rounds there, got to Reddit, Reset Era, a few other websites published this as a story, but it is a new patent where the title of it says, and I quote, backwards compatibility through the use of spoof clock and fine grain frequency control. 
Now, if that sounds familiar to you, there's a reason for that. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but this is not a brand new patent. It's new as in it has updated claims, but otherwise it's the same as the one we saw, you know, a long time ago back in 2015, 17, uh, another one like last year or something, but it's basically the same one. And if you actually read through it, you can pick up on it pretty quickly that this is for how PS4 Pro or PS5, you know, plays PS4 software more or less. I've read the entire thing, checked out all the new claims just to make sure there's no indicators of something beyond, you know, PS4 software, because keep in mind, you don't necessarily, we don't need a patent to tell us that, you know, PS1 and PS2 emulation is is coming, right? Or PSP games, because uh, again, this goes directly to the Spartacus news story about, you know, us possibly getting more legacy support. We don't need a patent for that. Patents are about, you know, inventing new ways to do things. Emulation is pretty straightforward. Uh, Sony's done it time and time again. PS5 can easily play PS1 and 2 software, no problem, uh, or PSP games for that matter. And there's certainly nothing in here regarding PlayStation 3, I can tell you that right now. Again, you gotta let go of it, probably not happening. Uh, but in this patent, some of the dead giveaways here, um, like claim number four, where it says, and I quote, a more powerful APU may contain an L3 cache for the CPU compared to a less powerful APU that did not have such a cache. In such a case, the memory latency characteristics differ as the time needed to access data that misses all caches increases for the more powerful APU, but average latency will decrease for the more powerful APU. Uh, PS4, PS4 Pro, PS5, those are the only PlayStation consoles that actually utilize an APU. Claim number 12 says, in one example, the more powerful console may be set to run at the frequency of the original console. Uh, claim number 12, the method of claim one, wherein the second clock frequency is less than the standard clock frequency. I mean, this is beat for beat explaining how a PS4 Pro or a PS5 would play games in backwards compatibility mode, where you wouldn't, you don't see this, you know, as a consumer, but when you're, when you're playing, your PS5 would, you know, execute PS5 software in PS5 mode versus, you know, PS4 Pro settings or a PS4 setting, right? It all happens behind the scenes, but that's how it works. Your PS5 is um, changing frequencies based on those games. It's trying to match that environment as exact as possible. And yes, it can improve it from there, right? But um, that's essentially how Sony does it. And that's why it's uh, in a patent. Again, we don't necessarily need a patent to see anything referencing uh, software emulation for PS1 to PSP games unless it's somehow highly unique and specific and they want to protect that invention. It has to be, you know, an invention. Um, and PS3, if anything, we would be able to know right away what they're describing if they did say come up with that because it would, you know, they'd have to describe this in some way, right? The PS3 environment is very different and there's nothing in here indicating that that is the case, right? So I hate to be the the bearer of bad news, but there's there's nothing in here for that. So this is strictly for what we already know regarding PS4 Pro and, and PlayStation 5. This doesn't mean we're not getting those older games. It's just that as a reminder, we can expect PS1 to PSP all day every day, but don't expect PlayStation 3. It's probably still going to be streamed. Now, getting into our next story, we have a very interesting development regarding the Twisted Metal uh, Lucid Games reboot where well, apparently VGC is citing an anonymous source that uh, Lucid Games has been taken off that reboot, so they're actually not making it anymore. Uh, the timeline here is that uh, Sony has apparently given that game to one of their internal studios in Europe. That was their original report from VGC, and according to Push Square, they say that they've heard the same thing late last year, but they more specifically call out the first party team was a recently acquired one, and the only one there that would fit that criteria would be Fire Sprite. Um, Push Square sources also say that the change was sudden and considered unexpected. Uh, one source told VGC that the change could have been due to the critical reception of Destruction All-Stars. And over on Recent Era, the user Tamari noticed that the game director Matt Southern at Lucid Games has recently joined Fire Sprite as a game director as well. Now, he was only there from August 2019 to January of this year, so that might give us a realistic idea of how long Lucid has actually had the game if they if they did have it up until the Switch, which again, apparently happened sometime late last year, which uh, Push Square said uh, it was around October. Uh, other points of interest here is that both Lucid and Fire Sprite are in Liverpool. In fact, they're very close together, and Matt Southern, the director, he's worked on various racing games, including MotorStorm. 
So now when we look at Fire Sprite, we can say that they're working on probably four to five projects at the same time because we know about Horizon Call of the Mountain, that's confirmed, but they also have job listings on their site for a dark narrative adventure game, AAA, uh, also a games as a service multiplayer shooter, now the Twisted Metal reboot, and then also before being acquired, they were doing uh, contract work for Star Citizen, which uh, whether that's done or not, you know, when they're finished with it, they're probably not going to do it anymore, clearly. So um, with that, uh, the acquisition of Fabric Games, you know, they're up to 250, 280 employees, somewhere around there, but they're easily one of Sony's largest first-party studios now. So they can absolutely do, you know, two, three games at the same time, possibly more, depending on how far along some of these things really are. But assuming everything that we're hearing about right now in this timeline adds up, then we can see what Sony's doing, uh, trying to make the transition as easy as possible because it's usually not good news when you hear um, a project being handed off to another studio but they're both in liverpool same director they're very close together um, so this might be the, mo the most manageable way to get lucid off the project which hearing that's not exactly surprising either um, i will always say lucid games they're a competent developer you know like destruction all-stars fundamentally as an ip um, has its fair share of problems in terms of the core mechanics they you know put in place and just the gameplay loop that they were trying to you know make like yeah it has its issues but the game itself is technically fine maybe if you give them an ip that exists and they know what to work with and build upon they might have a better shot uh but i still also have reservations in general about twisted metal making a comeback or having a twisted metal reboot because i still just don't know how well a car combat game is going to do nowadays right um yeah we still have these you know one-off things like Fall Guys, Among Us, or Rocket League, where absolutely we have these, you know, more obscure gameplay ideas that um, blow up and they work really well and they're a lot of fun. So maybe it could happen, but I'm still just not sure how well Twisted Metal would really do, you know, today or say in 2023 when the game is still expected to probably launch if they do want to release it at the same time as this TV show, which Sony doubled down on that during CES where they mentioned the Twisted Metal TV series. It is still coming. But if the game has been in development since around at least mid-2019 and assuming the transition, if it did happen and it didn't set development too far back, then we should still probably see a reveal sometime this year for what would be a 2023 game. Um, that and I guess it would uh, make more sense to give it to Fire Sprite because that is a lot of former, you know, Studio Liverpool Psygnosis staff that did, you know, the Wipeout franchise and Matt Southern does have a portfolio there that we can look at because with Fire Sprite we don't, you know, Fire Sprite as a new studio doesn't have much, only the persistence and, you know, one or two other things, but um, really uh, we can look at the, the employees and what they've done before and so they do have a racing repertoire that um, should be a... Uh, we can walk into this with a, a bit more confidence versus lucid um so now i'm just curious as to what this uh, reboot really looks like and hopefully we should see that by the end of this year next up let's talk about these two rumored playstation events that we should be seeing uh somewhat soon because one of these would be on february 3rd or somewhere around early february and then the other one would be towards the end of march so two big shows back to back this is coming from Tom Henderson, well known for the various Call of Duty and Battlefield leaks uh, throughout the years. Also one of our original sources on the Twisted Metal reboot and now a freelance writer across a bunch of uh, different websites. Uh, so he put out his own video going over this topic uh, about things he's heard behind the scenes. And as we were also expecting and theorizing, or at least I think this should happen, but we will be getting a state of play that will have a long form segment on Horizon Forbidden West. So possibly like eight or nine minutes of uninterrupted gameplay, kind of like what we saw for, you know, Demon Souls or Ratchet. But actually we might, um, cause those state of plays were just by themselves, right? This one might also include a launch trailer for Sifu. Uh, maybe Warner Brothers will have uh, more info ready for Hogwarts Legacy, which that's something that I've heard behind the scenes as well is just that Warner Brothers has been very careful about how they uh, release any info regarding that IP in general. So whether it's the game or something else, they're just uh, closely monitoring uh, public and media backlash. So as far as I know, they wanted to show it this year, but they just didn't for one reason or another. And then the other state of play, that would be towards the end of March, that would focus on the later half of 2022. That could showcase, you know, titles like Ghostwire Tokyo or God of War Ragnarok, and more importantly, uh, PlayStation VR 2. In fact, I'd, I'm surprised that that would include anything that 
was outside of VR. I kind of expect that PSVR 2 should have its own show purely for PSVR 2 software, but um, you know, he doesn't say all these things are going to happen exactly as is. Of course, things are subject to change, but that's at least what he's expecting and provides another update, or at least saying the same thing that he said on Twitter regarding The Last of Us projects uh, nearing completion, that all of them could uh, possibly be released this year alongside the TV show. There's nothing... Um, really eye-opening in here per se i mean it's a lot of what we've talked about for the past you know four or five months where it's like yeah we need to stay to play for horizon um just based on what they've been doing it seems pretty obvious that they'll they'll do that for horizon it's a big project a big game uh, oh same for gran turismo 7 i mean that's going to have some sort of a showcase as well or it's going to have a, a long trailer um to provide you know more media attention to that game and then psvr 2 obviously has to have its own show in some way i still expect it to be completely independent from regular 2d games but either way it would still be an appropriate place to showcase more god of war ragnarok and uh whatever we see with the last of us um you know assuming those projects are near completion then they have to have proper <laughs> they have to have proper reveals sometime soon right especially if we are expecting some of them to launch within this year Granted, it's only January, but once we're in February and then also towards the end of March, I mean, you have to talk about these things eventually. So um, it's not like everything's going to happen, but a lot of this stuff seems uh, par for the course, nothing unusual. In fact, I'd say a lot of the stuff, um, very there's a very real possibility that we'll see all this stuff happen exactly as he's describing it. Now, we have another rumor, this one regarding Sony and Square's relationship when it comes to not only the Final Fantasy franchise, but possibly doing another title as well. So the way this initially started was a Reset Era thread about Ubisoft Plus coming to Xbox, and Jordan Midler, a journalist at Video Games Chronicle, chimed in, uh, where he mentioned, it's interesting to see Ubisoft side with Xbox more and more this gen, while Square is firmly in Sony's camp, even beyond what's publicly known. He says in a separate post on the same thread, most of Square's stuff will end up on Xbox, but I wouldn't hold out hope for Final Fantasy unless something changes. Sony wants PS to be the home of FF this gen. FF7 was supposed to be on Xbox by now, but here we are. Now, these comments were posted on one website and then posted back on Reset Era as a separate thread. This is where this past week he finally elaborated further on what this actually, what he was getting at. So yes, there is another game in the pipeline after uh, after Final Fantasy 16, which might have PS5 exclusivity, but he does elaborate console exclusivity PC isn't in the same conversation. You can see how their PC ports are doing. Uh, number two, they didn't show the next PS5 title because Final Fantasy hasn't been shown yet and was supposed to by this point. Uh, by that, he means the Game Awards. So it turns out that, uh, well, we know that FF16, we didn't see it last year. Now we're waiting until spring, but that that game has to get its full you know, reveal and public mindshare showcase first before this next title. And then number three, because folks on Reddit have been guessing this, it's not Kingdom Hearts. He also says it's not a Final Fantasy game. It's just a game that would potentially divert focus away from Final Fantasy 16, which is the main focus right now. Uh, he also says it's becoming more and more likely that FF7 Remake doesn't come to Xbox at all. Uh, now, this is not the first time we've really heard some early indicators of this. In fact, because I know a lot of people are saying, oh, this is Sony being reactionary to Microsoft's uh, Bethesda acquisition. But remember, we had rumors right before PS5 came out, well before that acquisition, that Sony was going to be pursuing a lot of third-party deals that may upset people or anger people when it comes to locking a game down in perpetuity or timed exclusivity. And, you know, Final Fantasy has that close PlayStation association. So it's not at all surprising to see that this may be, you know, that may be in line with what we were hearing about before, right? Especially because, um, well, with FF7 Remake Integrade, that's where Sony probably did extend that deal because it was well known publicly. It was even printed on box art and trailers that FF7 Remake had timed exclusivity for at least one year. That implies that it can go anywhere after that, only went to PC after it was shortly extended for Integrade and now it's on PC, but still no Xbox release. Um, so yeah, Sony does this sometimes, right? In fact, uh, they don't, they didn't do it a lot throughout PS1. To, well, PS1, they were a bit aggressive because they were you know new to the market, but um, PS2 to PS3, you know, a little bit of it there. Uh, PS4, sure, but PS5, yeah, you can see how they're um, taking this very seriously. Um, 
and it's obviously a pain to people that play anywhere else nobody likes timed exclusivity or well-known you know third-party games that are locked up on one platform or another in fact this um, as an additional aside news story because there's really not much to this but we can also say on a recent Nate the Hate episode I'm sure a lot of you probably have seen that show as well um, doesn't often have major PlayStation rumors but um, there's a track record there where Nate's been pretty good and reliable for a handful of things not a hundred percent but one thing he mentioned briefly was Persona 6 would be uh, PlayStation 5 exclusive and that's actually something where I've brought up before when it comes to the next mainline Persona game because Persona 5 did so well and now there's so much exposure for that franchise it would really be Sony's uh, it would be their loss to not ensure that that game stays exclusive to their you know home consoles uh, not to say that I want it to happen, but just from a business point of view, it would really be their loss if they let Atlas say, you know, publish it everywhere, which actually Atlas is very strange with how they decide to go about putting some of these games out there where it's only PC, Switch PC, Switch and PlayStation. So it's a little weird on Atlas on, on their end as well, but either way. Um, it looks like there's still, uh, you know, the continued partnership is there when it comes to Square and, uh, and PlayStation. And now I'm, I'm actually curious what this extra game is, because with, uh, you know, Strangers of Paradise Final Fantasy, that was initially rumored as a uh, PlayStation exclusive, which was not true. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be a very interesting uh, next year and a half or so, depending on when this, no when this other game gets announced and... You know, if you play on Xbox, you probably should not expect FF16 anytime soon, which is uh, unfortunate. Uh, you have to remember, nobody's hands are clean when it comes to Sony, Microsoft, or Nintendo. Um, you can make the case for how Sony, you know, fosters a lot of, you know, developers from the ground up and things like that. And yes, they're well known for those sorts of things, but they will do uh, exclusivity with uh, third parties well, and that's really just a money exchange. And yeah, the company's uh, very committed to keeping PlayStation relevant and some of these franchises uh, having that association really stick and that's their that's their way of doing it Moving on to our next news story. It looks like a ps4 build of horizon forbidden west has leaked online uh, The way this started was a few screenshots circulating online and they looked real enough And it turns out they probably were because some places where they were posted like on Twitter uh, They were taken down at the request of a copyright holder uh, Also, we had a VGC again chiming in with uh, sources claiming the build or at least the the leak was real and the build is the entire game from start to finish uh, outside of a few missing art assets because we are like a few weeks away from the game coming out so it seems a seems really early but this is also like the last of us part two where it may have been leaked in the same manner um and yeah it's not good but i would uh, think that <laughs> i would think that sony's gonna stay really on top of this one based on their experience with the last of us part two so there's already takedown notices in a lot of places where this actually happened and I would just say be careful uh, if you're you know surfing Twitter or whatever uh, depending on the sites you go to or, or whatnot it's getting close enough where um, at least for some folks they're just uh, used to this now where they start muting words on Twitter and you know start browsing YouTube privately but that would probably that would be what I would do if you want to uh, avoid leaks but so far it seems like everything is uh, okay but just be mindful of that. Next up, God of War PC is finally available today, and the reviews were in earlier this week where it did quite well, currently sitting at a 93 on Metacritic, so it's a high-quality, uh, well-received PC port, which is surely what Sony wants to go after after some of the lackluster launches of Horizon and Days Gone, but uh, 93, not at all surprising. Obviously, it's a fantastic game, one of PS4's best, and... I'm sure this is going to be a highly profitable game, as explained, you know, before in Sony's, uh, you know, financial report with, uh, you know, some of their other PC releases. This is kind of what we were explaining. It was just leaving money on the table. That's why the company's finally doing it. That and they can, you know, stir up more interest for uh, the sequels for these games. So I still don't expect day and date um, within the, the short term, but yeah, they did quite well. And one little cool thing we actually heard about for God of War was... Um, the senior technical producer Matt DeWald on the God of War PC port was explaining because this game has one continuous shot from start to finish with no cutaways or loading screens or anything like that, um, it was actually a challenge to accommodate for ultra wide where you're starting to see things in that field of view that you otherwise shouldn't have seen. And for a game, you know, developed on console, which it's going to have a lot of you know, development tricks to make sure that you don't see things loading in or, um, you know, NPCs not being there appropriately when it, you know, moves over from one scene to the next in that one continuous shot. They uh, really had to work around that and play through the game meticulously from start to finish to see every single transition and make sure that, you know, 
the game was on the up and up and you didn't see something that you weren't supposed to. Um, I, I didn't consider that at the time with all this ultra-wide support, and for God of War, that is more of a unique scenario where, uh, well, the sequel is also going to do that as well. But otherwise, yeah, really cool to see, and yeah, well-deserved for the reviews. It's an incredible game. If you haven't played it yet, you, you owe it to yourself to give it a shot. Now, moving on, I think it's very important that we provide an on-camera update about this because last week I had to change the thumbnail and also provide a pinned comment on the, uh, in the comment section of that last week's video, but the one thing I uh, did not cover was uh, how Jeff Ross, the director of Days Gone, came to his 8 million, 10 million plus copies sold for Days Gone. So the one thing that was uh, missing from that is that he mentioned he got his number from GameStat, which is that old website that tracks uh, trophy data. So depending on how many players actually started the game, earned a trophy, um, he cross-referenced that number with the telemetry data that he could see on his end, uh, which we don't know what he was able to see in terms of player engagement, but he used that discrepancy to come to the conclusion of around 8 to 9 million copies, including uh, Steam, which keep in mind that's before PS Plus. But um, there is still a discrepancy to account for when it comes to, you know, somebody starting the game on two profiles and earning trophies. That's enough for it to count as two. Uh, used copies of the game, rentals. There's still the very real possibility that there's an extra, you know, half a million to a million or so, which may not seem like a huge difference, but it might not really reach the eight to nine million or so. It could be very much closer to six or seven million. And, you know, depending on the budget of the game, that could still be very much a problem for how Sony saw it. So it's just a few other things to be mindful of. Very important to be aware that it wasn't quite, you know, nine to 10 million or it could be in theory because we still don't have confirmed numbers. It's just that um, Ross may have oversold it a little bit. Not to say that he's, you know, completely in the wrong here because the game did sell reasonably well for what it did right but just keep in mind that um it was probably a little bit off there uh jeff ross did elaborate though on what days gone 2 might have had alongside that uh you know very short stint of conceptualizing a resistance open world game which i would have loved so the uh, core concept of that idea would have been something where uh it's an open world and you can always see the uh, chimera mothership and you have to work your way to it by you know recruiting npcs or uh just uh you know upgrading your character and things like that kind of like breath of the wild where you can always see uh, your objective in the distance but you have to figure out how to get there that's what that would have been and that idea or initial idea was from eric jensen so that would have been uh, really cool but that was a very short stint of them actually um thinking about that before again that was denied uh when it comes to or not entirely denied but it seems like they didn't humor that too much and so it didn't go very far days gone 2 would have had uh you know an expansion on deacon and sarah's relationship uh would have had swimming uh animals would have been fleshed out more to do you know different types of things in the environment um i believe we already heard about what days gone 2 was going to have right they also wanted to explore uh you know co-op as well so i'm sure they would have had a, a lot of very cool things to to do and build upon from that first game like he uh, fairly, you know, argued. Uh, a lot of games do get sequels where they can rectify all the issues of what was, you know, kind of like a seven and a half type of game the first go around. Uh, but either way, that uh, <laughs> the resistance idea sounded so cool. Granted, it did not get very far at all, but wow, I would have, I would have loved that. Now, with all that said, it is time for Let's Talk Plus, the weekly Let's Talk PlayStation giveaway where one of you can win a $10 PSN code. I would like to congratulate this viewer right here. I'll be contacting you very soon via email or Twitter. And if you would like to win a $10 PSN code, very easy. Follow the link down below. Support on this channel. A number of ways can gain you an entry. And I'll announce the winner next week because I'm trying to help pay for your games. Those are some of the stories that I wanted to talk about to you all from this past week. Uh, no Tuesday video, was a little busy, didn't have much time to get something out, but um, yeah, episode 500. So I've only missed one week, which was PS5 launch day that was on a Friday. Clearly I prioritized, you know, doing an unboxing, uh, UI walkthrough and all that stuff over the weekend uh, versus LTPS, but 499 episodes in a row, 500 total, doing this for a very long time, which is uh, really crazy to think about. And actually what I think we should do is really reflect on uh, what we did for episode 400. So take a look. Let's see what we did for episode 300. But um, just for the hell of it, uh, let's actually take a look at what we did for episode 200. 
Uh, and just for the hell of it, let's actually look at what we did for episode 100. And just for the hell of it, let's take a look at episode one. Roll it. The game. So now we know a little bit more about it. And stop it. Whoa, okay. Looks like I got a little bit better at this YouTube thing, huh? All right, I think I'm getting a little better at this YouTube thing. If you haven't picked up on it by now, I'm pretty much gonna do this every 100 episodes. So yeah, that clip's getting a bit too long. We have to move that to the end of the show. It's getting harder and harder to watch that and not visibly cringe, but hey, that's what we call growth, right? In fact, the one thing that's not growing, hair, lost a lot of it. I know, that's what happens. Actually, <laughs> I lost a little bit of it, then it came back. Fellas, if you're starting to lose your hair in your 30s, make sure you get on like Finasteride or something because hair plugs are expensive. You're not gonna go down that route, so. Either let it all go or get on something like uh, minoxidil or finasteride. Point is, uh, also hair's going great too. We're, you know, we've been doing this for a long time. And I know so many of you have been watching for a while as well. Oftentimes I'm reminded, like, hey Ryan, I used to watch, you know, or I, I've been watching since, you know, five, six something years ago when you did Let's Plays. Uh, it's really hard to try and say thank you and make it meaningful, right? Because I don't want to just say thank you and it's like, oh, whatever. Uh, so I guess the best way to try and describe it is thank you for allowing me to live this life. You know what I mean? It's uh, kind of crazy. I still can't really wrap my head around the idea that on a weekly basis we have 70 to 100,000 people tuning in uh, outside of LTPS exploring various topics across, across PlayStation hardware, software, whether it's documentaries, playing old PS3 games, uh, you know, opinion pieces unboxings, whatever, you're always here, you're always, um, you know, very supportive and appreciative. Whenever I say we, that includes you, because I'm one person, I do all the editing and everything on this channel. So I I like the fact that uh, you allow me to live this life. We also don't even do, you know, any sponsorships here, right? It's just the channel can run on its own at its own pace and, you know, you allow me to do what I do. So thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it and uh, we'll have, be doing a lot more LTPS stuff and, uh, other topics for uh, hopefully uh, as long as I can get away with doing it. So if you're still here, then I'll keep doing it. But uh, that is it. That concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Benecki. Thank you all so much for talking with me, and I will see you all next Friday.